Okay, so this is the kind of semi-lecture on types of camera shots. The goal here is to use um, Season 1, Episode 5 of Lost, to kind of show you what is the typical, um, what are typical shots that you would see all over, you know, the, all, all over film. Yeah, Max? I just have a quick question. Yeah. Um, are we going to be on this side of the library for now? No, okay. you won't. Okay, so types of camera shots, all right? This, is, this first shot is called an extreme wide shot. I'd suggest go ahead and bring it out your notes um, and put it into your vocabulary so it's easy to, to search later on. But this is um, an extreme wide shot. In Lost Season 1, Episode 5, there is not an example of an extreme wide shot. From what I know, there's only one extreme wide shot in most of the series that I can think about. So this is a great example of um, one from Lord of the Rings, okay? This wide shot shows us um, these things, okay? This is actually Minas Mordor, which is where uh, the ring wraiths actually have their lair, if you will. The view is so far from the subject that he or she isn't even visible. So the subjects in that image is actually the ring wraiths, okay? But you can't even see them, okay? The point of the shot is to show the subject's surroundings, okay? So it gives the audience a sense of this is where we are, okay? So examples would be like um, in The Matrix, seeing an entire view of the city, okay? Um, or in Harry Potter, it would be a picture of Hogwarts, all right? So your subjects aren't actually in the shot, that's just too far away. But it gives us a sense, like with Hogwarts, that we are approaching a magical place in the middle of England, somehow cloaked by some magical, you know, ability. Oftentimes, this is, um, this is abbreviated as EWS, and it's used as an establishing shot. An establishing shot is, in, this one and the next one are both used as establishing shots. But it, it gives us a sense of where are we. That's where it answers, Okay. Um, it's usually the first shot of a new scene, um, and it's designed to show the audience where the action is actually taking place. Um, it's also known as an extreme long shot. So uh, in scripts, you'll see it as either EWS or XLS. Okay? Cool? Any questions about that one? It's all available on your drive, okay. so you don't need to. Unless if you unless if you want. So that's when now we get into what did we see from the actual episode. So again, this is uh, the shot of Jack hanging from the cliff. It's an it's a very wide shot. Okay. This is much closer to the subject than an extreme wide shot. It's closer to the subject um, than an extreme wide shot, but still much further away than a wide shot, which we'll get into what a wide shot is. Okay. The emphasis is very much on placing the subject in his environment. So this is saying Jack is very high up about to die if he lets go, right? So it often works as an establishing shot. In this case, it is not an establishing shot because it's not actually, we already knew that Jack was climbing a cliff at this point, okay? However, um, this would be Batman standing on the roof of a building, Okay, so we get a sense that Batman is very high up. He's in Gotham City somewhere. That is the very wide shot. Okay? Um, it's typically abbreviated VWS. All right? And it allows for plenty of action to take place. Okay? Oftentimes, this action is giving, um, giving way to multiple subjects, but it's also um, potentially a place for dialogue to begin to start, okay? Now, a full shot. This is an example of a full shot. It's when the entire body is actually seen in the frame. So if you can see from head to toe, it's it is an example of a full shot, all right? Make sense? Now, if a subject was sitting down and you still saw from toe to head, is it still a full shot? Yes. Uh, 
um, does it take the whole width of the? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Okay. So if you can see the whole of your subject, it is called a full shot. Okay. Questions? Full shots. So as you can see, we're moving in. Now we've got a mid shot. Okay. A mid shot. Now, one thing that's really important to know is this. When you're composing shots, when you start getting this close, is you never, ever, 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 ever put the line of your frame, that is at the top or the bottom, you never put the line of the frame at a joint. So, for example, this shot is just below Jack's waist. As we go in further, you'll see the shots never go at these natural joints or natural lines on the body. Okay, so when we get closer into the clo in the in the close shot, what you'll see is this just okay below the shoulders. It's never going to do it right at the shoulders. The reason is is this: there is this weird thing when you're looking at somebody on film. If you don't have their shoulders in the shot, okay, it looks like they're just a head, right? If you just have it right at their neck, it almost looks like their head's been cut off. But just by going in a couple inches more, or coming out a couple inches more, it gives us a better um, sense of that person's body and frame. It just becomes more real, more natural to us. So the mid shot shows some part of the subject in more detail, but shows enough for the audience to feel as if they were looking at the whole subject. All right, This is an approximation of how you would actually have a conversation with somebody. So dialogue begins here. This is how typically um, dialogue is actually delivered. Exposition is often delivered at the mid shot. Um, but you, you wouldn't be paying much attention to their lower body, so the part is not necessary if you're really delivering that dialogue and exposition. All right, any questions with that? Um, one important note is down here, it says that it's, it's when the subject is speaking with, without too much emotion or intense concentration that the mid-shot is most appropriate. The reason is this, is that if you're too far out Okay, I mean, if you're too, if you're, if you're, my bad, if you go close, you're going to develop more emotion, okay? If someone was like really visibly angry with their face, okay, we probably want to get really close on that rather than at this mid shot. So emotion at this point is, you know, it's a, a little bit more challenging to really convey emotion here. So that's the reason why you push in, okay? That's the reason why your shot gets closer, is to deliver more emotion, all right? It allows more hand gestures and a bit of movement, obviously. So now we're going to get into the close shot, okay? Close shot. This is just above the waist, okay? Here's an example of Shannon talking to Sawyer, okay? The close shot shows the face more clearly without getting uncomfortably close. So the difference between a full shot and a, and a close shot is, a, is literally below the waist or above the waist. It's not too uncomfortably close, but at this point we can deliver more emotion. Okay? Hand gestures are more contained in the frame. All right? So oftentimes mid shots would be used for people reacting to something because they can move their hands around. They can... They can walk around a little bit in the frame. They're a little bit more freeing. Whereas the close shot, again, is delivering more emotion with body language outside of the hands. Does that make sense? Following? So, then we get into the full close-up. A full close-up is anything just below the shoulders and up. All right? This is an example of Jack here as he's hanging for his dear life. All right? This full close-up, you got a lot of emotion here, right? Can anyone else give me another example of a full close-up from a movie that you've seen recently? That's really interesting, isn't it? But it, we'll watch a Law and Order here in just a second. And what you'll see is 
these shots happen next to each other all the time. Oh, I guess. I guess yeah. Uh, an example could be like when like you're watching crime scenes. Like I watch a lot of law and order and stuff, criminal minds, and they're like interrogating them. Um, there's sometimes when they'll get. Absolutely, the interrogation scenes, particularly when they're starting to get close, when they're about to get you know that closure, right? right. You typically will get to a full close up, right? Now, an extreme close-up. Lost is amazing about this. You can actually go and uh, search the web for eyes lost, eye close-up lost, and there's actually a compilation of every one of these shots. Most of the first and second season starts with an extreme close-up on an eye. It's a critical um, piece of cinematography um, as uh, eyes are this idea of looking into one's soul. Okay, that these this is looking into the depths of who they are, which again is a theme in Lost. That if you're caught up so much on what is the island, you'll miss one of the true intentions here. Extreme close up is also known as XCU, the full close up. What do you think it is? FCU. Okay, seeing the abbreviations here. All right. Um, but the extreme close-up gets right in and shows extreme detail. You normally need a specific reason to get this close. So Damon Lindelof, J.J. Abrams, they intentionally bring the camera. You can see it written in scripts that they wanted the entire episode to start off this way with this close-up on the eye. It's too close to show general reactions or emotions. So you're not getting super emotional facial you know but at the same time like if when the show opens with an eye right at you that's shocking right oftentimes these extreme close-ups are fairly shocking in um uh dramatic type scenes okay now what's a cut-in a cut-in is in the midst of action you're putting images into the exposition to potentially um show a character's plight or to provide um, the audience a sense of relief okay so in interviews you see this a lot in interviews you'll see people talking and doing you know their their deal okay they're just you know in their interview what they'll do is they'll cut to their hands it could potentially be a creative idea but here's another reason why you use cut-ins for editing okay so let's say there was a bad take that maybe, you know, Matthew Fox, who plays Jack, as he's, you know, hanging for dear life, okay, and uh, obviously we know he's not that high up, it's probably green screened, but he's holding on to this root, or hanging for dear life, right? And let's say it was a great shot up until the root breaks. Snap! And everyone starts laughing on set. Matthew Fox, he falls back on his butt. You know what I mean? Like, it was a great take up until that point. Well, an editor, what they can do is we can say somewhere in that take, okay, at the end of that take, we can splice two takes together and put this on top to cover the cut between where the first take that went bad at the very end and then the second take that was good it's a place for us to actually be able to cover any sort of cuts. So that's what cut-ins help us do. Does everybody get it? So it's a cut-in because it's cutting into the action. All right? So cut-in refers to someone sh to showing some part of the subject in detail and can use purely as an edit point or to emphasize emotion. For example, hand movements can show enthusiasm, agitation, nervousness. So then if that's a cut in, what is a cut away? Any thoughts? Mm. I'll, give you, I'll give you an idea. What if two people were having a dialogue about a person? Okay? Let's say that um, uh, Saeed and Shannon are having a conversation. And they're talking about Jack. They don't know it, but Jack is behind them. So as they're cutting between their conversation, the film director cuts to Jack's face because he can we can we know that he's behind them, but they don't. That's a cutaway, okay? It's something different than the subject. Alright? 
It's used as a buffer between shots, okay? Or to add interest or information. So cutaways often end up you being helpful to exposition. It can show us while somebody is talking about something, it could potentially juxtapose action that's contrary to what people were actually saying. Okay? Now, a couple more shots and we'll be done. An example of a two shot. All right? I bet you can guess what a two shot is. When just two people are in the shot. When just two people are in the shot. Fantastic. What's a three shot? Three. When three people are in the shot. Great. So two shot is a little bit different than the other shots. It's not necessarily composition. It's a way for us to say we want both of these people in the frame. Okay, so in your script, when you're writing it, you might have two characters going back and forth in dialogue. Well, then you can write in the shot composition of, okay, if this one was an over-the-shoulder shot, which we'll get in a second, whereas this one is, you know, a medium-close shot, okay, which is one we didn't cover, but there's a medium-close shot, then we could say, all right, now we want them both on scene by saying now it's to a two-shot. Does that make sense? Cool? You getting it? And we'll actually look at a script to kind of get a sense on how all this works out. So two shot, all right? A one shot could be a mid shot of either of these subjects. A three shot surprisingly contains three people, like we talked about, all right? Often it's used in interviews, okay, or during dialogue, right? It's often when it's happening. That's the reason why you would want to show two people. Now, um, yeah, I won't overcomplicate it. So this is an over-the-shoulder. So this was the scene where Jack is um, trying to argue with the flight attendant about getting his father's casket on board the plane, which is some really interesting irony. I think what you will see with a lot of the characters on Lost is that if they didn't press themselves to be on that plane, they probably wouldn't have. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's really interesting. All right. So, as you can see here, it started off with this um, dialogue with the, with the flight attendant at the gate. Jack reacting. Is the one on the left, bottom left, an over-shoulder shot? Or is it, more it still is an over-the-shoulder shot. It still is. Shot considered it could be a two-shot. All right. Oftentimes, two-shots are probably more straight on. Okay. Um, but I would consider that either one. I think you could go with either way. Uh, I'd be interested. We can look back at the script. I have this script. Um, we can look back and see what it called for. Um, it might be a two shot. Now, what is this an example of? Another over the shoulder? Mm -hmm. No. Nope. So this is over the shoulder, over the shoulder, over the shoulder, potentially two shot. What is this one? Away, a cutaway, exactly. The reason why is that a cut in would be cutting into the action. So this could be Jack fuddling with his passport or the flight attendant um, pressing a button. Um, actually, that one wouldn't be a good one. Or the flight attendant typing on her keyboard, okay? What this is, it's cutting away from the action. But if you notice here, Jen's right here in the background. Okay, but this is cutting away. This is delivering some exposition for us that Jin was in the same place at the same time, witnessing Jack's frustration. This might be important in another episode that we know that they were in the same place at the same time. So, over the shoulder, this shot is framed from behind a person who's looking at the subject. It helps to establish the position of each person and get the feel of looking at one's person from the other's point of view. Okay? This is where a lot of dialogue happens. As I said, we'll watch it here in a second on Law & Order. It's common to cut between these shots during a conversation, alternating between the views. Next week, we'll dive into frame composition. Left third, right third, center third. Okay? The, rule, the golden ratio. We'll talk about these sorts of things and how you actually set up, not just the shot, but how your subject is actually in the shot, okay? Nodding shot, okay? 
This is when it cuts back to somebody nodding. Also, you'll see this um, particularly in interviews when like people are watching crowd shots like that are also considered a, a nodding shot. <laughs> point of view. I love that this episode started with a great point of view shot where we first established that Jack in his young age was on the ground, right? Staring, watching another person beat up. Notice. The juxtaposition, the putting together of these two shots is Jack looking in a direction and then us assuming this is what he's looking at. How do they show us that this is Jack's point of view? What are they doing well, in this think, shot? I think one thing that that's like, up, like almost like you're looking at it like he is right now. Uh-huh. That, like, uh, whatever, you know. Uh-huh. Uh, place. Also, the, the um, background, not the background necessarily, but like the... Um, yeah, the camera's tilted, right? The camera's tilted. And not only that, exactly what you're saying, Max, is because... Say again? I was also saying like the black top, you know? Okay. Okay. So you're connecting the background? Yeah. All right, with the foreground of this subject? Great. He's also looking up, so we can assume that there's a little bit of angle here, right, that's looking up. So it's basically what... What would it look like if the character was actually, you're looking through the character's eyes? That's what the point of view shot is. Okay? So those are our basic camera shots. All right? Cool?